I want to start with this as a follow-up. This was a this is a concept that is different, really, from any of the products that we've looked at so far today. This is a totally interior air-to-water heat pump. Uh, the units that we've looked at so far, either the split systems or the monoblock systems, basically you're taking part of the heat pump outside to excess outside air. With this kind of a concept, you're bringing the outside air in to the heat pump. So everything stays inside. I like this idea, especially you can see some of the advantages of it. One is that you eliminate any antifreeze. Another one is that you, um, you can do domestic water heating with it because again, everything's inside. I think one of the other big advantages is everything that any service that is done on this is done inside. You know, it is arguable that when it's 10 degrees outside and there's two feet of snow and there's any kind of a heat pump element, whether it's a split system or a monoblock outside, that's not an ideal situation to service from. So I want to show this. This is actually not a product that's currently available in North America. This is from a company in the Czech Republic. Okay. Here's another one. This is another European product. This is not sold in the United States, but I want to show you the concept of it. It's basically designed to go in the corner of a room and it brings outside air into an air handling section through the um, fan up here. And the coil's mounted at a 45 degree angle, so the airflow goes through the coil. That's your evaporator coil and heating mode, and then it discharges out 90 degrees away, and that's so that the two air streams don't mix with each other. The, the rest of the unit, I'm sure you recognize most of the heavier components, the compressor and so forth, small buffer tank, all built into a unit. Um, I would love to see more products like this in the North American market eventually. Uh, again, it's not to take away from the split systems or the monoblocks. It simply does bring everything inside. I wanted to show it to you as a concept. Okay. Now, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this. Uh, I think one of the things we've heard several times today, as it gets colder outside, the, both the heating capacity and the coefficient of performance of heat pumps goes down. And any manufacturer can provide you either tabular data or a graph that would show this. But just to give you a typical idea here, we're looking at heat output, and there's two lines here. One is based on water temperature leaving the condenser at 95. That might be a very well-designed low temperature radiant panel system. Uh, the other one is 131 degrees, and this is actually from a European product, so that's why kind of the odd numbers here. And you can see that performance going down from roughly about maybe Oh, say at least 70,000 BTUs per hour down to just above 20,000 BTUs per hour. It's a big span of capacity from, well, 75 degrees. Most people wouldn't be heating at that temperature. But even at 65 degrees, we're at about 60,000 down to, oh, maybe 22, 23,000 at a minus five. But the big difference in water temperature that, on, that you're working with on a condenser really shows up on a coefficient of performance. You can see how these lines separate here. So to bring the COP up, we really want that low water temperature. Uh, it does make some effect on capacity, but a big difference in COP. Uh, this is from a different heat pump, but these are, again, typical trending lines for cooling capacity. And it's really the same story. As it gets um, hotter outside, you can see the cooling capacity drops and the four different curves here are just for different chilled water temperatures leaving the heat pump. And I mentioned this morning, if you can design your cooling distribution system so that it could operate at perhaps 55 degree water versus 45 degree water, you'll see there's quite a difference here in cooling capacity for any given outdoor condition. Same story now, we don't call it COP traditionally. Uh, in a cooling mode, it's usually called energy efficiency ratio. But again, bringing the chill water temperature up 5 to 10 degrees is going to improve that energy efficiency ratio. And that is, it, it's very similar to COP. It's just the different units that it's expressed in. Higher EERs are better. Okay. Now, um, uh, Dave Sweet mentioned that 
when you, when you look at the heating capacity of a heat pump, it's decreasing with outdoor temperature. So we'll start at 70 degrees outside and we'll go down to minus 10 here. Our heat pump heating capacity is going down, but our heating load is going up and it's more or less proportional. Okay, so in this area of the graph right here, the heating load is less than the capacity of the heat pump. That means the heat pump's either going to slow down the compressor or it's going to cycle on and off. We've got excess heating capacity. Right at this spot here, traditionally called the balancing point, that's where the capacity of the heat pump exactly matches the heating load. And that's an ideal condition with the heat pump running all the time. In theory, um, you would be right here. But of course, that's only at for a given building, that's only at one outdoor temperature. For a given size heat pump, a given building, given um, <clears throat> system, it's going to be that one temperature. Once we get over in this orange area here, the cooling, I'm sorry, the uh, heating load is higher than the heating capacity of the heat pump. So we're going to have to supplement it some way. It might be automatic supplementing with an electric element. It could be a boiler that could supplement it. or it could be as simple as somebody says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to light a fireplace. I'm going to light a wood stove. Okay, we, we just, we did a project like that a couple years ago, and I, I kind of wanted to have it in writing that the backup is going to be the wood stove. Because automatic is what most people expect. And typically that is what, you know, most of these systems we've talked about today have the ability to bring on electric resistance heat automatically. And then <clears throat> finally, that red area, I showed it, as a possibility, if it's extremely cold out, depending on the heat pump, and again, you've heard from manufacturers, that can be easily down to zero degree Fahrenheit, in some cases, uh, several degrees below that, minus four, minus 10, and so forth. But at some point, if the heat pump shuts off, then you would have to have complete backup for that, just showing that as a possibility, okay? Now, I wanna show you another way to look at the usefulness of a heat pump in terms of when can its capacity be best used over the course of a season. And to do that, we're going to start off with something called bin temperature data. This happens to be for Syracuse. Again, you can get this data from ASHRAE. You can get it from um, ACA Manual J. And all bin data is for a given location is to take the outside temperatures over the entire year and break them up into five degree increments. So for example, in Syracuse, from maybe uh, when the outside temperature is between zero and positive five, maybe about 60 hours a year. Syracuse, definitely colder than we are right here. But one of the things I want you to see is how many hours out of the year we're at temperatures well above zero, up in this range right in here. And again, in Syracuse, oftentimes winter days, we talk about 10 degrees, 20 degrees, maybe 25. There'll, there'll be a week or two when it doesn't get above freezing in Syracuse. That's probably not the case down here. So we start with the bin temperature data, but I'm going to show you a different way to plot that. What this is called a heating duration curve. And what it is, this is the percent of the design heating load. Now, design heating load is what we're designing the system for. It's not necessarily the absolute coldest outdoor temperature you could possibly get, but it's typically, depending on how you define design load or design temperature, ASHRAE typically defines it as what's called the 97.5% design temperature. That means 97.5% the temperature of the entire year, the temperature is at or above this design condition. And you can see here, there's a little bit of yellow area just above that red line. That would be conditions that that two and a half percent of the year when it might be a little bit less than the design temperature. Now, this axis here is hours in a year, and it's actually hours when the load is greater than a, a given percentage of the design load. So for example, if we said how many hours a year would the heating load, I thought I turned that off. Sorry about that. There we go. How many hours out of the year would we be at 
or more than 40% of design load. Well, start at 40, hit the curve, 3,600 hours in a year. Okay, so you can see that yellow area under that curve. The nice thing about plotting the data this way, the yellow area under the curve is proportional to the total space heating energy use for the entire heating season. That's a key concept. That yellow area represents, in mathematical proportion, the total energy for space heating over the entire year. Okay, And you can build these plots just starting with the bin temperature data. Now, when you put this heating duration curve together with a heating capacity curve for a heat pump, okay, this blue area that you see here under the black curve, think of that as a percentage of that total area under the black curve. Okay, let me, let me flip back to that last slide. The total yellow area here is the total space heating energy use. The blue area there is a, certainly a large percentage of the total area under the curve, and that would be the energy supplied by the heat pump. The orange area in the far left, that would be the supplemental heat requirement. And then the pink area over here, in theory, this is where the heat pump has more than enough capacity for the load. Okay? As you change the size of the heat pump, that green line there is going to shift either up or down, and that's going to affect the percentages or the proportions of the total space heating load that is being supplied by the heat pump. Now, I drew the graph one other way just to illustrate a possibility. If the heat pump shuts off at some minimum outdoor temperature, okay, then you can see the orange area here becomes larger because now we, we cannot service the load if we're below that outdoor temperature. As, as this technology gets better, we're shifting more and more towards the graph on the left. Now, you know, if you live in Fairbanks and it's 40 below zero or 50 below zero, we aren't there yet. I don't, I don't even know if the CO2 guys are there yet, maybe in theory. But for New England, we are largely moving to the point where this isn't going to happen. In this scenario, and again, remember, some of these graphs, I wanted to show it to you just as a comparison, but some of these graphs are based on where the industry was probably 10 years ago. Now things are moving towards, towards that scenario. This shows you how if I go to a bigger heat pump, see what happens? The orange area gets smaller. This is where we originally had that line drawn, and the percentage of the total seasonal energy supplied by the heat pump gets larger, and vice versa, if I decrease the size of the heat pump, I can evaluate, um, again, what percentage of my total space heating load would be supplied by the heat pump. Okay, freeze protection. Um, use antifreeze in the entire system. And I, I, I'll back that up when I'll show you some slides of my system. We did put an isolating heat exchanger in so we could use just glycol in the outer unit coming into the brace plate. It does work, but there are two things that are working against you from, from an um, efficiency standpoint. One is you need two circulators. You need a circulator between the heat exchanger and the heat pump, and you need another circulator from the heat exchanger into a buffer tank. So we're going to have the higher power requirement of two circulators. Uh, certainly you have the cost adder of the heat exchanger, the piping, the fittings. You know, I'll give you an example. The, the heat exchanger we use, I'll show you a photo of it. It had inch and a half MPT connections on all four ports. In, or I'm sorry, inch and a quarter. Inch and a quarter FPT to one inch copper adapters are $14 a piece. Okay, so those costs add up pretty quickly on that. Um, so you can buy a lot of antifreeze for what the heat exchanger and the piping um, to add that heat exchanger uh, total up to. I'm not a great fan of antifreeze. I, I kind of developed this saying over the years, the only good thing about antifreeze is it doesn't freeze. Everything else is a lie. Everything else is an issue. It, obviously, it adds cost. It is a maintenance. It should be checked annually for pH. Um, how many here have spilled propylene glycol all over your toolboxes besides me? Okay. So, you know, it's, it's a necessary evil, I guess I'd say. 
So I, I approached my system. I said, you know, we've had water in it, and it was a retrofit, a building been there 18 years. I said, let's leave the water side alone. We'll just put this heat exchanger in. And as I say, it works, and it works pretty well. But you are, um, the other thing I want to point out about a performance, besides that additional circulator, you're forcing the heat pump to run at a higher temperature than it would if that heat exchanger wasn't there. Heat exchangers bring thermal penalties into systems. Now, we generously size the heat exchanger. It's a 5 by 12 plate size, 100 plates deep. That's like 40 pounds of stainless steel, okay? So its approach temperature difference is very small. It's like 3, 4 degrees. What would the heat exchanger rate at if you Depends on the temperatures. Um, at a 5 degree approach temperature difference, it was rated about 60,000 BTUs per hour, okay? It's a, it's a big heat exchanger. Now, it still induces a thermal penalty on the heat pump, okay? And uh, again, I've not sat down to analyze that in detail, but I want to bring that up as, as designers, as you folks think about things, should I use a heat exchanger? Should I just go with all glycol? My opinion has kind of changed on that. I, I'm of the opinion now, probably go with all glycol and eliminate it. It simply makes things simpler. Uh, Dave was mentioning up there, too, that they're using small amounts of glycol for burst protection, not so much freeze protection. The difference there is, is substantial. A, a lower percentage of glycol will still protect you against burst pipes, even though the solution can't be pumped at that point. Okay? So here's, here's what we did with the heat exchanger. Okay? And again, you can see the two pumps in here. And because this is a completely isolated loop, it needs an air separator, it needs an expansion tank, it needs fill and purge valves on it. It's just that standard hydronic trim that you have with any closed loop system. Okay? One of the things I would stress to you if you're going to use a heat exchanger, maximum approach temperature difference under full design load heat transfer, no more than five degrees Fahrenheit. And that approach temperature difference is the difference basically, this would be the hot antifreeze solution coming from the heat pump. This would be the water leaving the heat exchanger going back to your buffer tank under maximum heat transfer, no more than five degrees there. Less is better. I mean, the theoretical perfect heat exchanger would have a zero approach temperature difference. You'd, you'd leave here at exactly the same temperature you're coming in on that upper left port, okay? And same thing in cooling. There's several sources for brace plate heat exchangers today. Uh, but one of the software packages that's out there, and it's free, it's, it's just online software, it's called Flat Plate Select. I like it, it's very simple. You go there and basically you put in the flows and the temperatures that you're trying to work with. It will tell you if you've over-specified. In other words, if I create a condition on the water side here that would represent 50,000 BTUs per hour, heat transfer, and then I create conditions inadvertently that represent anything but 60,000, It'll tell you you have to, you know, either leave something off. It's, it's a pretty nice little program. And basically, it spits out for, for a given um, combination of temperatures and flow rates on two sides of the heat exchanger. This tells you, uh, that of course, they're specifying their model number here, but it's a 5 by 12 plate size. So it's 12 inches tall, 5 inches wide, 70 plates deep, and it tells you the um, piping connections on it. And I'm sure there are other manufacturers that have similar sizing software, but it lets you do the what ifs. If I go to a bigger heat exchanger, how does my approach temperature difference change? And obviously bigger heat exchangers, more metal, more, more cost. And I did a photo just to show you kind of a size comparison. If you put one of these between a four ton air to water heat pump and a buffer tank, it's not gonna work. You're creating a massive heat transfer bottleneck. You simply don't have the surface area to transfer the BTUs from the heat pump to the buffer tank without a large delta T between the two sides of the heat exchanger. And, you know, that's just not going to happen well. Or if it does happen, you're really forcing the heat pump to operate at very high water temperatures, low COPs, okay? So forget this. Here's a 5 by 12. You can see just a bigger plate size. And then this is 40 plates thick. That's 100 plates thick over there. 
you can actually uh, find these at pretty reasonable prices online, and I'll just I'll leave it at that. But stainless steel, don't undersize the heat exchanger. Okay. Another concept, um, and the fellow from Sandin touched on this, using multiple air-to-water heat pumps, and, and Nordic as well. This is just uh, three. Uh, those are monoblocks that are set up outside. Um, they're set up. Uh, one of the things that is nice about this uh, is that they, um, they don't blow air at each other. Okay, You don't want to set up two heat pumps so that one heat pump discharges into the inlet of the other heat pump. Think about that. All right, you're sending air through the first heat pump, you're pulling heat out of it, you're cooling it, and then you're dumping that cool air back into the second heat pump. You're forcing a, a performance penalty to some extent on that second heat pump, okay? Piping-wise, just to give you kind of a broad picture, this sets up, first of all, the entire system would operate with antifreeze, so there's no heat exchangers here. Uh, it sets each heat pump up with a combination of valving so that it can be uh, online with the risers. And these, these are the risers in the system. Think of these as the common pipes that connect the heat pumps back to whatever it is you're, you're going to do. And over here, you can, you can see there's a chilled water tank, there's a hot water tank. This would be kind of a commercial application. It could be done on a large house. Uh, if you're looking at these heat pumps as being typically up to about five tons as a monoblock is a practical limit, above five tons you start to get into three-phase type uh, systems. So let's say I had uh, you know a fairly large house and I wanted three five-ton heat pumps. I can set them up like this. My control system would turn on the valves as appropriate so that I would have flow just through the heat pumps that are operating. Now, that in itself is an important point. There's no reason to send flow through a heat pump that isn't operating. You know, you, you could say, well, you could eliminate all these valves if you just pump through everything and just turn the compressors on and off as you need it. But anytime you have flow, you have pressure drop, right? When you have pressure drop and flow, that's energy. That's mechanical energy that ultimately ends up as electrical input to a circulator. So running flow through devices that are not really functioning, doing anything for you, adding or removing heat, it's sort of like driving your car around with your foot lightly depressed on the, on the brakes all the time. It just wastes energy. So by setting these up, think of these as zones. Instead of zoned heat emitters, you have zoned heat pumps and you have a variable speed circulator down here. As these heat pumps turn on and off, that circulator will speed up and down. You want to make sure that the flow path through is going to be blocked, and a three-way might not do that for you. It depends. Uh, if the heat pump is not operating, there's, there's no, you don't want flow going through it. Okay. Um, the rest of it is pretty uh, straightforward. You've got a chill water tank hot water tank. This would be useful in a commercial building where a building like this would probably be a reasonable example. There's going to be days when you have a perimeter heating load, but a core cooling load. Okay. And of course, in the middle of the summer, everything's going to be in cooling. In the winter, you might still have a slight core cooling load. So the decision to use a, a chill tank and a hot tank in a system, you, you can't just uh, make that arbitrarily. You have to look at where do I have the loads? When do they occur? But it's more likely in a commercial building where you've got a lot of computers, a lot of people, lights and so forth, where you're going to have that core cooling load perhaps even 12 months out of the year. So we could, for example, have one of these heat pumps operating at a given time. We could call one heat pump to operate on a chilled water tank and all it understands is keep this chill water tank between an upper and a lower temperature limit. Some other external controller would probably do that and simply turn on a heat pump as necessary. It would use uh, staged what's PID control, just like we use with multiple boilers. If it's um, seeing that that chill water is not uh, recovering fast enough, it's going to go to the second heat pump. It's going to use a um, a PID control loop to determine which heat pumps should be on. You could set this up for a priority. 
In other words, if you have a, a large cooling demand and heating demand, which it's unlikely, but if you had that, your control system would have to make the decision which, which one gets the priority. But the important thing here, too, is any of those three heat pumps can be called independently into either heating mode or cooling mode operation. Okay, So it's not like all three of them have to be in heating or all three of them have to be on cooling. And the rest of it, this is just a zone distribution system, preferably going to low temperature emitters. And this would be zoned air handlers. Okay, And variable speed pumps through everything. These are all um, high efficiency variable speed circulators that adapt to valve openings and valve closings. Okay? And I, I'm sure if you've you know, designed hydronic systems, you can, you can see a lot of the elements that are in this system are not new elements just specific to um, air-to-water heat pumps. I could take the air-to-water heat pumps out and put three geothermal heat pumps in and leave the balance of the system the same. Okay? So it's, it's, a, it's a staged concept there. Okay, so importance of low temperature distribution systems. Um, this text in red is kind of my own design philosophy at this point. It has been for a number of years. It's not a code. It's not an ASHRAE standard. But my view on our market, where we're going globally as well as in North America, uh, the days of high temperature hydronics are, are fading away. As, uh, again, Dave mentioned this, whether you call it decarbonization or electrification, the market is moving towards uh, lower carbon heat sources, which is really going to help the heat pump sector of that pie chart grow. And to make these systems compatible, not only today with heat pumps, remember I used this, this word before the break, I call it future-proofing. We're designing distribution systems that could last easily 50, 60 plus years. They'll outlast anybody in this room, right? So why not take that into account today and design for the likelihood that those future heat sources are going to operate better at low water temperatures? If, if they are heat pump technology, unless somebody changes the laws of refrigeration, okay, they're going to operate better at low water temperatures. So I, I set the bar at 120 degrees at design load. If we can stay at no higher than 120 degree water temperature supplied to our heat emitters at design load, we are widely compatible with pretty much anything that's on the market today. Certainly boilers can do that. If you work with ModCon, boilers are going to operate more efficiently at those low water temperatures. If you want to do a, a ModCon boiler today and you might put a heat pump in in five years, your distribution system is compatible. So it's this idea of not doing today something we have to do, undo, five years from now, ten years from now. Okay. And there's a lot of product and, and concepts out there. Uh, panel radiators. You're probably wondering, what's the stairwell doing in here? Well, this is a radiant panel on both sides here. This is radiant wall heating, okay? Radiant ceilings, high output fin tube. This is another panel radiator that has some small fans built into it. And you can see from the uh, uh, thermal graph here, this is actually a radiant wall panel here, just built into the vertical web of a uh, attic truss. So there are a lot of systems. I'll run you through some. First of all, here's one not to do, okay? This is a, a photograph a contractor sent me. You're looking up at the underside of a floor deck. This is electrical cable, forget about that. This is half inch PEX tubing that's been clipped like every two or three feet onto the bottom cord of a floor truss, okay? We have a term for this. We call this a thermally constipated system, okay? What's that? It's supposed to heat the floor up here above the orange shag carpet, okay? That's somebody's idea of floor heating. Bad idea. And I, I, unfortunately, I could show you a lot of pictures, not perhaps worse than this, but plateless staple up systems are not going to work with air to water heat pumps. Let's blanket statement. That's not a good way to do it because this is just stupid from a heat transfer standpoint. So, Please, whatever you do, 
whatever heat source you work with, don't staple half inch PEX tubing onto the floor framing. All right. Now, how about baseboard? Again, I mentioned baseboard is a price point product. It uh, was developed decades ago when fuel was cheap and it was commonly developed around the idea that boilers are providing 160 to 200 degree water. You can derate baseboard. Here's a derating curve. This is typical residential single tube, two and a quarter inch square aluminum fins. And it goes down substantially with water temperature. So at 120 degree water in a baseboard, you're getting about 30% of what you'd get with 200 degree water. What does that imply about the length of baseboard that you would need? We could go to higher output baseboard. I don't want to dismiss this. My advocacy is keep the baseboard. Keep it in there. It's surface area of heat emitter. Okay, if it's, if it's functional, if the aesthetics aren't objectionable, in other words, they aren't trying to take the baseboard out because the aesthetics of it, okay, leave it in there. Add supplemental heat emitters to it. But remember, the trade-off is all about surface area. The more surface area, the lower the water temperature, the better the heat pump operates. Here's the high output baseboard, or one example of high output. This is the, the heating edge product. Um, you can see, if you look at the fins here, it's about, actually that shows it better, it's about three times the fin area and two tubes. So it's not rocket science, it's simply a much bigger heat exchanger inside an enclosure that is roughly about what we expect the enclosure to be for fin tube baseboard. And the output on this is a little more than double what standard residential output is. So this could be used as a replacement. It could be used as a supplemental heat emitter. You could certainly do a whole house with this if you wanted to. You could mix some of this with some panel rads or some floor heating or some ceiling heating. I just want to show you it's another tool at your disposal uh, that was designed. And remember, this, this does ultimately come from the European market. And why is it coming from the European market? Because that's where heat sources, I, I think it's mandatory now that every boiler in the UK has to be modulating condensing. Is that anybody know that? I'm pretty sure that's mandatory. So the European market is forcing people, forcing the whole industry towards these low temperatures. If you build baseboard and you want to stay in business, you better build a product that is compatible with where the legislation and where the, the technology is going. Okay, uh, Panel radiators, one of my favorites. Uh, again, you go to Europe, you'll see these everywhere. So they're lesser known in North America. They're very easy to work with. They're light. They're nowhere near as heavy as a cast iron radiator. A lot of times we say radiators today and people think, old, antiquated, heavy cast iron radiators, which, by the way, can work if they happen to be in the building. But these, uh, these hang from brackets on the wall. You can see the two pieces of tubing coming up from the floor. This is half-inch PEX aluminum PEX. just connects to the bottom. Anybody know what that knob is on the top there? Yeah, it's thermostatic radiator valve, right? And for years, we've called these things non-electric thermostatic radiator valves to emphasize there's no wires or batteries but we've got a much sexier term for these today. These are wireless thermostatic radiator valves. Do you ever think about that? This, this is wireless zoning. You can do this on a room by room basis. So if that room happens to get an internal gain from sunlight or people or equipment, that room by itself can adjust the flow. This will automatically adjust the flow of water going through that. Anyway, I wanna show you this this is a picture of uh, four images over a period of four minutes, starting from a radiator with no water flow going through it. All I did is I turned the radiator valve up. This radiator was in setback, and I just started taking pictures like at one-minute intervals. And one of the things that you can see here, these radiators, there really is very little water content and not much metal in these. There's enough metal, but the idea is they're low thermal mass. They respond quickly. And as we go to lower and lower heating loads in buildings, fast response is becoming more and more important because internal gains that you don't control are going to have more of an effect on comfort in a well-insulated building than they are in a poorly insulated building. 
So the ability of the heating system to respond quickly to changing conditions is important. So again, I think as we go forward, low mass hydronic emitters are going to be a bigger percentage of the picture. Now, just like baseboard, these are typically rated at higher temperatures. If you read sort of the fine print, the average water temperature in the panel was 180 degrees when these outputs were created. These black numbers are BTUs per hour. But I want to show you these panels are available in different widths, different heights, and different thicknesses. And you can, again, derate or adjust the output of these panels. Uh, there's a couple ways to do it. You can use that curve, and that curve is very similar to the curve that you have for baseboard, or you can use the formula in the graph. But just to give you an idea, as an approximation, a panel rad operating with an average temperature of 110 in a 68 degree room, it puts out about 27% of what it would at 180. There's no getting around this. When you bring the water temperature down, the output goes down. So if you want the output to be where uh, needs to be, you've got to size the panel around the water temperature. So you're not going to be using panel reds that are, you know, two feet wide, 10 inches tall, and two inches thick when you're using an air to water heat pump, unless your loads are tiny. Okay? You're going to be using larger panels. It's again, back to surface area versus water temperature. Um, here's another example. Uh, these are nice products. Uh, the concept here is a deep coil at the bottom of an enclosure. So this is a multi-tube pass fin tube element. And on top of these, on, the, on top of the fin tube are these very small fans. These fans are like the fans you have in a desktop computer. They are variable speed. They draw about 1.5 watts each at full speed. And they're, they're fairly quiet. And they are in there to enhance the convective output under low water temperatures. Again, this is a European product responding to the need for low temperature heat emitters. And the, the engineer that was involved in designing this told me personally, these were developed specifically for the heat pump market in Europe. They wanted to build a heat emitter very compatible with the water temperature requirements of, well, both geothermal as well as air to water heat pumps. And these products are available uh, there's a couple manufacturers uh, that have these in the U.S. market. And I, I think you'll probably see more of this the next five years. I think you're going to see more of fan-enhanced, very low power. You know, we're not talking, these are all 24 volt, okay? We still have the thermostatic radiator valve on there, so it still regulates uh, based on um, the room temperature. And these fans are actually run by a very small little printed circuit board. And I, I'm not sure exactly what they're controlled on if they're based on a water temperature, uh, but they will speed up and slow down. Here's a radiant ceiling panel. Okay, yeah. Radiant ceiling panels, real quick construction. We'll start off with some kind of ceiling framing. It could be a truss or it could be joists. Okay, the first layer here is 7 16 oriented strand board, just a common building structural panel you'd buy at a Home Depot, for example. Uh, that gets nailed up to the framing. The blue material is three-quarter inch thick polyisocyanurate foam board. Again, you could buy it at Lowe's. It's, um, it's, a, it's commonly used as a sheathing material. It has a foil facing on both sides. That's important. Okay, the way we're going to hold that up to that 7 16 uh, OSB is with contact cement. The same kind of contact cement you'd use for a laminate countertop. And you don't need much of it. This board is very light. And you're gluing it there just to hold it there temporarily because the ultimate clamping system is going to be the drywall and these two and a half inch screws. Okay, So we, we put these foam strips up and you can see them glued up there. Uh, the next thing are the aluminum heat transfer plates. And these are available from different sources. The function of that aluminum plate is to diffuse the heat away from the tube, spread it out. Those go up with contact adhesive. You put it on just one side so the plate can expand a little as the tube gets pushed into the plate. And then you do, do a pressure test. And finally, you put half-inch drywall up. And these screws just have to be long enough. 
Uh, notice here, the screws don't go up through the plates. The screws are between the plates, all right? And certainly you don't want the screws going up through the tubes, right? But that works out very well. And what, you know, what he's going to do now, he's, he's actually using a little coil bender there. You don't really need that. With that tubing is all eight inches on center. And you can see the detail out of here at the end. They just held the foam back so they have a space to do the U-bend. We're not in there trying to carve that foil-faced insulation to the shape of the tube. It's just, it's not worth it. Here's, a, here's an infrared photo that shows how that's performing. You see the, the red on there? What's the red telling you? What, this is actually taken when the panel was warming up. Can you tell me which way the flow is going? Left to right. What we're shooting is that ceiling. We're shooting the surface temperature of the drywall. And what that red is showing you is how good a job those plates are doing diffusing that heat away from that tube. Really important. Plate le if we left the plates out of this system, probably most of it looked like this. Okay. This eventually is going to transition to something close to this. All right. But I can't overemphasize those plates are really important to diffuse the heat away from the tube. And then this is a, a simple way to, to calculate the output of that, this particular system. This is all 8 inch on center, half inch tube. Um, average water temperature in the circuit, let's put a number in it, say it's 110 degrees, average. Minus the room temperature, say it's 70. So that's a 40 degree temperature difference times 0.7. You're getting about 28 BTUs per hour per square foot. Folks, we're building houses today that have design heating loads, cold to stay heating loads, 10 BTUs per square foot or less in some cases. What does that mean? It means you don't have to cover the entire ceiling with this panel. You might come in four, six, eight feet. That's all you need. Okay. Now, if you do cover the entire ceiling, the advantage from a heat pump standpoint is what? Lower water temperatures. So again, we're back to that trade-off, but this system works really well. We've done this with this particular job. It's actually tied into a geothermal water-to-water -water heat pump. But if it works for geothermal water-to-water, -water, it's going to work with an air-to-water as well. When you push the plate up in here, if you look real carefully, you see there's a little gap on the left side? You want to bring the plate to one side, and the side with the, the glue on it, push it up. And that way, when you push the tube up into the plate, the plate can expand. If you glue both sides of this down, especially if the plate is slightly overbent into an, a more of an omega shape, you're going to end up trying to pound the tube up into the plate. One of the other things we use is, uh, I don't know if it's on here, but we use um, PEX aluminum PEX. Anytime we're using aluminum plates, we like PEX aluminum PEX tubing. Coefficient of expansion is very close to the plate. So we don't get that differential movement to, to the extent that you would with a PEX tube and an aluminum plate. PEX to aluminum is about a 10 to 1 ratio on expansion coefficient. PEX aluminum PEX to, to aluminum is it's much less. The, the tube does move a little bit more than the plate because of the presence of the PEX, but it's very small. Same system turned 90 degrees, radiant walls. Okay. Again, you can see the red here indicating that the, the plates are doing their job. All right left the plates out where there's receptacles, turn the box. This actually is an inch and a quarter deep uh, plastic um, junction box. So it finishes flush with that whole assembly. We can actually fasten the back of that box right to the OSB. And by the time the drywall is on, you're out an inch and a quarter. So it worked out really well. Um, finished wall, just standard wall. And I, I mentioned earlier, there it is. Uh, you, you can't see it which is, I guess, part of its attraction. But that is radiant wall heating. So you can integrate radiant walls into surfaces that otherwise, you know, we don't normally think about. One of the really nice applications for radiant walls, and I'm going to state right up at the beginning, you don't use drywall with this, is a walk-in shower enclosure. Walk-in shower enclosure. Instead of drywall, you'd put up a uh, cement board, and then you would put ceramic tile up on that. You could set that up as a separate zone, put it on a timer, wind up, simple little wind up timer switch, and it'll warm up the walls of the shower. It also helps dry the shower walls out after, you know, after the shower, so there's less chance of mold. I mean, these are all sellable concepts, all doable with off-the-shelf hardware from any number of 
manufacturers. Same construction, just turn 90 degrees, little higher output. Same mathematical form, but before on a ceiling this was about 0.7, now it's 0.8. Anybody know why? On a wall versus a ceiling? Convection, higher convection on a wall. So at 110 degree water in a 70 degree room, you're getting about 32 BTUs per square foot per hour. You could build a wall four feet high and heat an entire room from that. You don't necessarily have to take that radiant wall all the way up the height of the wall. You could, you could put a chair rail there or something to uh, delineate it, or you could just fur out the studs up above where the wall is. But the point is you get good output at water temperatures that are very compatible with an air to water heat pump. Okay. Now those are all low mass. I, I don't want to leave out the possibility of high mass. Radiant slabs are, are great. Um, I'm a big believer in under slab insulation. Um, our spec is always two inches of extruded polystyrene as a minimum. Um, and you know, there are other products on the market. Um, all I can say is this, ask yourself this question when you're deciding on underside insulation. If I get it wrong, how hard is it to retrofit under slab insulation? That's the question. Standard styrofoam that you'd buy for um, sheathing is about a 15 PSI rating. So at 15 PSI, it's a 10% compression, long term. You can buy extruded polystyrene up to 100 PSI rating. So if you're working with a fire, uh, um, fire station, aircraft hangar, truck garage, we've done uh, several highway garages. We specify typically a 60 PSI foam with either a six inch or an eight inch slab and structurally you're all set. Make sure you've tamped the subgrade. Obviously if the subgrade is mud and you're throwing, you know, 60 PSI styrofoam on it, it's, it's going to have a problem. But the other thing is you lift the tube, get the tube up into the, doesn't have to be dead center, but it does make a difference in water temperature. This is just a graph. I use this a lot. Um, it gives you basically for different finish floor resistance values. This would be a bare slab here, finish floor resistance of zero. And I, I just made it for two different tube spacing, six inches and 12. It gives you the output in BTUs per square foot per hour versus the delta T between the average water temperature in the circuit and the room air temperature. And you can look at that later in the PDF file, but uh, you'll find, as I'm sure many of you know, adding resistance on top of the floor will significantly increase that water temperature. If you throw a polyurethane pad down and a Berber carpet on a bare slab and connect that up to a heat pump, it's not going to be optimal. I'll just leave it like that. Okay, so you've got to think system wide when you when you apply these heat pumps and you want good performance. Don't do things that are going to be significant impediments to heat transfer somewhere else in the system, like undersizing a heat exchanger um, or putting some kind of a high resistance floor covering it. Now, I, I want to spend just a few minutes on this modifying these high temperature systems. Okay, just as a quick example, every hydronic system, if you took all the controls off the system and just turn these systems on, every hydronic system tries to find a condition called thermal equilibrium. And it's a simple idea. The, the heat source is putting so many BTUs per hour into the system and the system is trying to dissipate that. And the water temperature that that system will stabilize at is where the rate of input equals the rate of output. Nature wants the balance between input and output. So if I use a 20,000 BTU per hour heat source and I put 31 feet of baseboard in, I will stabilize where the supply temperature is about 180 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, that would be kind of a typical temperature for fin tube. But if I put 111 feet of baseboard on exactly the same heat source, even if I turn the aquastat on that heat source up to 180, it's never going to get there. And it doesn't have to. 120 degree water with this much baseboard would dissipate 20,000 BTUs per hour. So systems are seeking that equilibrium temperature. More surface area, lower water temperature. Okay. Basically it comes down to two things that you can do. 
uh, and they are not mutually exclusive. So one is reduce the design heating load of the building, and you know there's a million ways to do that. You can add insulation, you can change the windows, you can improve the air leakage situation, or some combination. Or the second option, you add heat emitters. And it doesn't have to be the same type of heat emitter that's in the existing building. You could add panel radiators to a baseboard system. You could add wall heating to a baseboard system. You can mix and match as each situation requires. I'm not going to bore you with the math because we don't have the time, but I, I just want to show you that it's in the slides on the PDF you'll get. There's a formula up there that lets you evaluate if I reduce the energy design load of the building, all right, if I reduce it by whatever measures I choose to use, I can, that tells you what the reduction in the water temperature is going to be. And just as an example, I took a building that had an existing design load of 100,000 BTUs per hour, assuming we're maintaining 70 degrees inside, and it was using 180 degree water at design load to get that 100,000 BTUs into the building. All right, if I reduce the load to 70,000, so I've taken 30,000 BTUs per hour out of the design load by whatever envelope improvements I've chosen to make, my design load water temperature now is 147 degrees. It's not complicated math. It's basically recognizing that the water temperature changes proportional with the load. So I drew a couple outdoor reset lines here. At zero, this is the original system needing 180 degree water. And now, without changing anything as far as heat emitters, I'm down to 147 degree water. And if I'm using outdoor reset control, I can further lower those water temperatures under partial load conditions, and that's all going to improve the performance of that heat pump. Now, 147 is still a little high for most R410A type uh, heat pumps. But, you know, again, if I reduce the load further, this purple line would come down farther. So load reduction is a vi very viable strategy. It's often more cost effective than doing other things. I say that I've been involved with some programs that have um, incentivized various renewable sources and they've totally ignored looking at the building and trying to deal with the load before you tackle the problem by throwing more of the renewable energy component at the building. Load reduction is, is really some of the money best spent. Now, um, earlier I showed you these two graphs here. Remember that yellow area under the curve represents the entire space heating energy requirement? I took that purple line from the previous graph that was a design load of 100 and, or, I'm sorry, design water temperature of 147, and I lined it up with design load on this graph, all right? And then I said, well, how much of that load can be supplied at a water temperature no higher than 120 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So I took 120 degrees here, and if you just draw that line across, you line these two graphs up, the blue area represents seasonal heating energy supplied above 120. The yellow area represents seasonal energy being supplied at 120 or less. Look at how much as a percentage of the total can be supplied, this is, with, this is with simply reducing the design load of the building so I could go from 180 to 147 under design load conditions. I didn't make any modifications to the distribution system. I'm still, uh, I had the numbers on here, there it is. Only 6.5% of the seasonal space heating energy needs to be supplied at water temperatures over 120. So, you know, back to Rob's point, electrical energy as backup. Yeah, it's expensive, but you don't use a lot of it, especially if you modify the, or reduce the load of the system. You know, you're trying to minimize electric resistance heat. It's one of the first things we look at when we're evaluating a system is, what's the design load? And then I want to know how much baseboard is in there. And I just divide the length of the baseboard into the load and figure out what kind of water temperature is necessary. And if you've got somebody that has done, I call it wall-to-wall -wall baseboard, where they just put baseboard all over the place. Yeah, it could operate substantially lower, right? And, and nobody knows it. 
somebody's turned the aquastat on the boiler up to 180, and the thermostat just, you know, burps heat into that system. Now, the other option is adding heat emitters, okay? And there's, you know, I'm not going to read all these to you, but there's a lot of decisions here. Obviously, the, the cost, the aesthetics, the practicality, where can I access to, to time your question, where can I access existing piping to make connections to it, okay? Um, again, I, in the interest of time, I don't want to walk you through this, but this is a step-by-step -step procedure. If I want to calculate how much additional baseboard I need to bring the water temperature down to a certain value, there's a, there's a way to do it. There's the formula. Um, I ran through an example. We had a, a load of 40,000 in the building, um, 120 feet of standard baseboard, and that was based on, I think I got it here somewhere. I think it was based on 180. And I want to bring the water temperature down to 120. Well, you run through this procedure and you figure out I need to add 154 feet of baseboard. I won't say it's impossible, other than kitchens and bathrooms. Check, you know, go check out your kitchen and bathroom and figure out where you're going to put even 10 feet of baseboard, right? But it's it's going to be very difficult to do this. The bottom line is standard residential fin tube baseboard is really not the best product to look at from a practical standpoint for adding heat emitters. Now, if it's already in the project, as I said, use it, add supplemental heat emitters to it. There's another formula if you want to go to high output baseboard. This shows you that high output is, is substantially higher uh, per foot than standard residential baseboard. You're going to use less of it. I did an example on the same building. Instead of having to add 154 feet of standard baseboard, now I only have to add 67 feet of high output baseboard. Now again, you got to go into the project. Where would that go? The, the thing is, these, these number crunchings are pretty simple things to do. And you can do this with, you know, basically if you know the load of the building and take an inventory of what baseboard is there now, you've got a good starting point to make these kind of comparisons you know, find out what, uh, what's possible. Um, now, here's a common setup for residential baseboard. You know, this is back, think, 1950s, 1960s. You've got a boiler, could be oil, gas. You've got a circulator, and you've got a series loop of fin tube. Series circuits are really not very flexible. Um, you know, uh, obviously, you can't do zoning. If I want to turn the temperature down in this room, about the only thing I could do is I could partially or fully close a damper on a fin tube. A lot of people don't even know those dampers are in there. Okay, If you close the damper down, in theory, you get about 50% of the output. How many people do you know that go around moving the dampers on their baseboard? It's just, yeah, they're there, but it's not very practical. Okay, What you want to do is basically go from this piping topology to something like this. You're going from series to parallel. Okay, that in itself is a, is a big advantage. Now I've, I've created from a single series circuit, I have strategically cut that circuit. And when I say strategic, every project's gonna be a little different. You've gotta go find where you can access the piping. You know, an ideal scenario, all the baseboard, at least for the first floor, pops down into the basement, right? And I can just get up there and access it. Second floor is gonna be a little bit more of a challenge. But what I've done is I've, you know, I've shown here existing baseboard and I've added some baseboard, all right. And then this could be um, copper, okay. And then I've transitioned over to half-inch PEX and brought that back to a manifold. The reason I've transitioned over, first of all, you know, sometimes people say, well, you're going from three-quarter pipe to half-inch pipe. Aren't you worried about the flow? I've got four parallel circuits instead of one series circuit, okay. The flow can be a lot smaller and still suffice here. Um, and the half-inch PEX is going to be a lot easier to run through the framing cavities compared to rigid pipe. Uh, on this circuit, I added a panel radiator. Okay, And in this case, I added it at the tail end of two baseboards. So these are existing baseboards. So I transitioned over to PEX. And again, there's several fittings that let you do this either on an angle or a straight connector. 
up into the panel red and then half inch PEX back to the manifold. Here I added a panel radiator on the supply side. And you know, every one of these scenarios is potentially different. You've got to walk the building, see where you've got the area to do this. Obviously, get the owner's preferences. You know, am I going to just stay with baseboard? Am I going to go to panel rads? There is no right answer here. It's just a matter of I have to add surface area to bring this water temperature down, and I need to find some reasonable way to do it. And then once I figured out how much area, what's a reasonable way to pipe it? Okay, here I've added TRVs. Now I've got four zones. Before I only had one zone. Even when I converted to parallel, let me go back. This is still a single zone system. I'm running all four of these at, simultaneously. It's okay, but now that I've got four parallel circuits, it's pretty easy to take it over to this and add the thermostatic radiator valves. And the other transition, I got rid of the fixed speed pump and I put in a, a variable speed ECM pump. So as these thermostatic radiator valves open and close, or modulate, that pump will automatically change its power input and uh, again it's a further enhancement to the system. It makes sense when you're adding valving to use a variable speed pump. Okay. Um, thermostatic radiator valves, uh, one of the questions we get, well suppose I put eight of these in my house, when I go on vacation do I have to go around and turn each one of them down for a setback? It's a possibility. The thing that I don't like about this is just having to run all the thermostat wire. It just adds a lot of labor to do that. But again, if you want, you know, you want a nest thermostat to run all those zones, um, that's that's a possibility. The hardware exists to do that. Okay. Now I I, I do want to caution you on another thing. Even though we're talking primarily heat pumps. When you modify a hydronic system and you're going to take that water temperature down in that range of maybe 120 degrees at design load, don't destroy an existing boiler if it's going to remain in the system. All right? Because if I run this boiler at those low water temperatures, I could have a cast iron boiler that's run fine for 20 years under those high temperatures where the flue gases don't condense in the boiler. But now I've I've modified my system to run at much lower water temperatures. If I don't put in one of these thermostatic mixing valves, we call these anti-condensation valves. If I don't put those in there, I'm going to eventually destroy that boiler or the venting. And I've seen venting go in six months. You can rust right through a galvanized vent connector with a condensing cast iron boiler. So again, it's back to the system. I'm adding a heat pump. I'm, I'm modifying the distribution system to bring the water temperature down. If I choose to leave that boiler in place, I really should put some type of boiler protection in there. Okay. Um, I just want to show you, here's a, a heat pump. Uh, that's a mono block, and these are flexible one inch line sets. We purposely put that little offset in the piping so they could flex a little bit, just a little bit, instead of being completely straight. And I, I want to show you this detail for going through a wall. Took a hole saw or a pilot bit, first of all, went all the way through the wall so we have a straight path through the wall. Took a hole saw, just a little bit bigger than a two inch uh, Schedule 40 PVC pipe. And then we just wrap some electrical tape so we have a nice tight friction fit here. And put that sleeve in there. Now here's the concern. You got a copper pipe going through a wall. All right, let's say you're running this heat pump in chill, chill water mode. What's going to happen in the summer? You could have condensate in the wall, and over time that could go into a mold problem. So we've got a plastic sleeve that goes through the wall, and the pipe comes through. It's one-inch copper. Here's the transition over to the flex hose, and then we foamed it. Just get yourself a can of great stuff and spray it, okay? And then outside, you take a hacksaw blade and just trim it off, and eventually you want to insulate it. And what isn't on there yet, it should have some kind of a UV resistant um, tape on the outside so it doesn't deteriorate with time. But that makes a nice, uh, it makes a nice transition through the wall. So you don't have, if there was any condensate, hopefully the foam here should insulate it to the point where it won't condense. But if there was, the PVC pipe is in there so it doesn't drip into the wall. And we're almost ready to wrap up here. Now, what I'm going to show you, again, you can study this more in the PDF, but 
I, I put together a couple system examples. Here we've got a monoblock system outside. The entire system is running with antifreeze. And I'm using what's called a reverse indirect here. And there is at least one manufacturer that has this. If you're not familiar with it, it's a steel tank shell. And it has multiple suspended copper coils in it. The domestic water is in the copper coils, not in the, the shell of the tank. So what the heat pump is doing is it's warming this tank up. And the nice thing about this, this, is do, this tank is buffering two loads. It's buffering space heating and domestic water. Okay, Domestic water, you, cold water goes into the coils. Depending on the temperature of the tank, you pick up whatever you can. All right, If the tank was at 120, 125 degrees, maybe you're at design load conditions, that's, that's the vast majority of your temperature lift, assuming your domestic water requirement is 120 degrees. Okay. If you're using outdoor reset control, uh, you might not have it that hot. And maybe it's a milder day and the tank's at 95 degrees, but you're still going from cold water temperature to, let's say, at least 90 degrees. That's probably still at least 50% of your temperature lift, so 50% of your load. And I'm showing just a tankless electric water heater as a backup, a little 12 kW, okay? The one lesson I have learned on that, and, and I say lesson, I'm I knew enough, fortunately, not to do this. Um, I would not put one of these things in in a house that doesn't have a 200 amp service entrance. They draw a lot of current. A 12 kW takes a double pole 60 amp breaker. Okay, and some of the early generations of these, they use a triac to switch the uh, current on the element, and you're actually going to get a little flicker on the lights. I think that's been improved upon. Okay, but the option here would be a, maybe just a 30-gallon electric water heater, and we always like to see an uh, um, anti-scald valve in there. But the rest of it's very simple. It's basically just a loop. And then uh, for space heating, we've got a couple pump zones going off the radiant panels. Okay. This one is heating only, yes. I got one coming that's got cooling in it. It's a good point. This is, this is only functioning in, in heating. No glycol feeder. You could put a glycol feeder in there. I mean, we'd probably push a little extra antifreeze. We'd like to oversize the expansion tanks on a glycol loop. So you can push a little extra antifreeze in there, or uh, extra solution. And that way, as your air vent gets rid of some of the dissolved air, you don't have to come back and pump this thing back up again. And I just want to point out real quick, I'd like to put together a description of operation for every system exactly how every component in that system works in different modes. Okay, so how does the heat pump work? How does space heating delivery work? How does domestic water get heated? How is power supplied? You know, you're going to have a dedicated circuit going to the heat pump. Where's the power for the zone circulators coming from? Okay, put together a description of operation so that not only can you verify as a designer that you've, you know, you understand what you've created. That sounds like something that shouldn't be necessary, right? You create a complicated system and you, you, know, you end up with nine pumps in the system and you've only got eight pumps in your description. Then go back and figure out what happened to that missing pump. Okay, you didn't put it in a description. It helps you as a designer to create a good narrative of how the system operates. And then there's an electrical schematic, which is pretty simple. It's a multi-zone relay center. And in, in this case, it's got a set point controller in it. It's pretty simple. But this gives you the wiring. This gives you the piping. This gives you how it's supposed to operate. And this is, this is value added to the system. Show this to prospective clients to give them assurance that, first of all, you know what you're doing as a designer. And they have lasting documentation. So if the original installer is no longer in the picture, somebody else can read this and troubleshoot the system. It's, it's common sense. I mean, would you buy a $30,000 car that had no owner's manual and there was one guy maybe in Detroit that understood how that's supposed to work? No. Okay. Now, um, here's one that does heating and cooling. And again, it's just a, it's a monoblock going into a buffer tank. This is all antifreeze. And then the variable speed pump goes up to a couple zone valves that do some radiant panel heating. Could be floors, walls, ceilings, combinations. 
okay? I've grayed out two air handlers here, and I'm sure you can figure out what's going to happen in the, in the uh, summer. I just changed that over. So now we're, we're doing chill water in a buffer tank, same variable speed pump. Now the zone valves can open on the two air handlers. Again, you could, you know, you might have a small house that only needs one air handler. You might have a big house, you have three or four air handlers. You can scale this concept up. It's really nothing more than zoning with zone valves and using a variable speed pump and drawing off your buffer tank. And this is what we call a three pipe buffer tank. I, I like this versus a traditional four pipe. The reason is if the load is on at the same time as the heat pump, which is likely, some of the, in this case, the very coldest fluid can go directly to the load. You, you don't have to force everything to go through the buffer tank first. With a four pipe buffer, it's basically source, buffer, load. With this, the load's here. You can, you, if the load is off, you can just, you know, depending on how you set the controls up, you might set the controls up to maintain that buffer tank at chill water conditions, irrespective of what the load is doing, as long as the system is in a cooling mode. The advantage of that is when one of those cooling loads calls, you've got a reserve of chill water ready to go immediately. The disadvantage is you're storing chill water and you're, you have a delta T across the insulation on your buffer tank, so you're going to have some more heat gain. And you know, neither one of them is the right answer. It's just a matter of if your client says, well, I hear that thermostat click or push the button, I want cold air coming out those air handlers as fast as possible. Well, flip the switch into cooling mode, maintain the buffer at 50 degrees, maybe 55. As soon as that zone valve opens, the pump's on and you're sending chill water. Here's a description of operation. Again, I don't expect you to read it now. Uh, I'd like to put together, you know, depending on the controls, and there's a whole range of products you can work with, I like to put together a ladder diagram. Uh, I find in it, from a design standpoint, it's very easy to uh, create this, even if some of the logic that you're creating in the ladder diagram eventually gets displaced over to some other dedicated controller. But the important thing here is everything is labeled, okay? All these components are labeled, and you can see if you just glance at this text, those labels are dispersed through all those uh, descriptions. So a technician can read this, and then he can go find the components in the electrical system and the piping system that are necessary. Um, air to water heat pump plus, plus a boiler. There's a lot of ways to do it. I happen to show one here just to show you variation. I put a heat exchanger in here between the heat pump and the, and the buffer tank. And I put the boiler on the upper half of the buffer tank. Okay. One of the things that you might run into in a retrofit is a boiler that's already short cycling because it's been grossly oversized, especially if the load has been reduced in the building. So when you go in there to retrofit that heat pump, why not try to fix that, that short cycling situation? You know, sort of like the patient's on the operating table and you've cut the patient open and, you know, you're, you were going to take the appendix out, but you see something else that should be dealt with, all right? And if you've got a short cycling boiler, you could put it across the upper portion of the buffer tank. And, and I say the upper portion of it because we'd still like to keep this water down here. Uh, we don't want to elevate the, temp the entire temperature of the buffer tank to the point where we're starting to impede the performance of the heat pump. I think the, the fellow Dan from Nordic was mentioning that with their system. You don't want a situation where inadvertently you've got an energy source that's back feeding into the system. And that, that potentially would happen if we kept this entire tank warmed up. So I'm just piping that across here. And then the detail over on the right side, that's that little external, uh, what we call the um, sidearm heat exchanger for domestic water. It's got a flow switch on cold water. So when somebody draws hot water, the flow switch turns on a circulator, probably through a relay to make sure you don't cook the switch in this. And then you've got a stainless steel heat exchanger. And the beauty of these, they respond like that. Literally, in two seconds, these things can go stay, uh, steady state. Uh, you mean put them in series with each other? 
the, the problem with that is suppose something breaks down on either one of them. You've got a series circuit now, you're, you're down. If you put them in parallel, there's uh, you know valving here. So if this was broken for some reason, I could close the flange and the, the purge valve here and pull that out of there if I needed to. But if you put them in series, remember the other thing about uh, series with an air to water, let's say that uh, you know the boiler's on, there's something shut off on the heat pump, I've got to take my warm water out through the heat pump, bring it back inside. So I'm going to have a higher heat loss to the outside. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to put the heat sources in parallel with each other. And then think of it, the heat source is dumped to a common buffer tank. By the way, you know what the Europeans refer to these as? Thermal accumulators. That's a pretty cool term, thermal accumulator. So they, their view is we have multiple heat sources, everything dumps to the buffer tank, and then we pull multiple loads off the buffer tank. Okay. Um, again, I built a ladder diagram around it, and there's a description of operation. You can look at that later. And I'll finish up with this. One of the things I, I do, I write a column for plumbing and mechanical called the glitch and a fix. So I try to create systems that have problems in them or will have problems. And then it's kind of like the hydronics crossword puzzle, figure out what's wrong. Okay, so here's a system. This was in one of the last um, glitch and fixes. And it's got an ear to water heat pump in it. Uh, it's got a boiler in it. And the boiler's connected with a pair of closely spaced T's and its own circulator. And then we've got a lot of zoning going on over here, individual circuits on individual thermostats. And I don't want to spend a lot of time, but the thinking of the installer on this was, um, I'm going to use the boiler to make sure that the heat pump doesn't freeze. If the heat pump was off for some reason, I'll just uh, uh, bring some warm water back from the building and go outside. This is kind of back to the question uh, uh, of putting the heat sources in series with each other. Now, it's not a perfect series relationship, but see, if the boiler's doing the heating and we have warm water going in here, I mean, this water is still warm. It might be 95 or 100 degrees. And I've got to take it outside where I'm going to lose heat through the heat exchanger. And even though that heat exchanger is wrapped up, I mean, if you do the math on a one degree temperature drop at 10 gallons a minute, it's a pretty significant BTU per hour, especially if it's there, you know, many hours out of the winter. But I, I don't want to have that loss out there. So real quick, I modified it. I put the heat sources in parallel with each other, and I added a buffer tank. If I go back to this, what's going to happen when one zone calls, and this thing is maybe a fixed speed heat pump, think about 50,000 BTUs per hour, and I have a load here of 1,500 BTs per hour. And I've got three gallons of water as my thermal mass in between. So um, the slide that has the listing of the errors is in the PDF. I, I skipped it just in the interest of time. Adding the buffer tank, going to a variable speed pump, doing my zoning, however many zones I want. Uh, Dave mentioned the term micro zoning. That's a, a common problem today. One of the things we can do with hydronics we, we could zone every room. You know, I've had people say, I've got 20 rooms in a house, I want 20 thermostats. I try to talk them out of it. I do my best to talk them out of it. But if that's what they want, you know, uh, 20 thermostats and four miles of thermostat cable, and, you know, you're in business, right? How many uh, zone centers is that going to be? Four year, six zone centers, right, Dave? And you're in business. I mean, you can wire those things all together. But it's, it's not a question of, can I do it? It's a question of should I do it? All right. Anyway, I want to thank uh, Mass CEC, Grace and uh, Meg, and is, is Beverly still? Oh, she had to leave. Okay. Uh, they worked very hard to organize this uh, uh, despite our late start due to unforeseen circumstances. I think it's been successful. I, I do want to thank the manufacturers too that came. I think it was really nice to see not only that there are several products in the market that add uh, validity to the market, this market is going to grow. So if you're involved with hydronics now, I'm not telling you to, to shun boilers. I'm not telling you to shun geothermal heat pumps. 
I'm saying you have one more tool to put in your toolbox now, and that's an air to water heat pump. So watch this market. I think uh, the next three to five years is going to be a very interesting time. A lot of it's going to be dependent on what happens with tax credits. If we go back to an unsubsidized market level playing field, I think that's going to push things even farther. Thanks for coming, guys.